Bible says in Corinthians, let me give this passage to you, it's 1 Corinthians uh, 16, 19. The churches in the province of Asia send you their greetings. Achilla and Priscilla and the church that meets in their house send warm Christian greetings. You know, all the believers here send greetings. So I, I want to let you know that our church, Living Hope, sends you greetings. And as I see that your church here that's meeting in this house, it takes me back um, it's about 18 years ago that I left the, the Methodist church and then I went and I took on a position of a pastor for a congregation that had about 25 people. And they were the children of the first generation of Koreans. And so, you know, I, I, in one sense I was stepping down because I was, I was going from this larger size congregation and everything in the United Methodist Church going to this other church that only had 25 people. And I was like, how could you do this? And I said, well, God is, you know, I'm doing this for God. So this is not nothing to do with, you know, this or that. And uh, I just want to let you know that God was with us and we, uh, we eventually left out of the mother church and we started on this journey about, you know, 13 years ago now on our journey. And uh, as we did that, um, we no longer became Korean American. Uh, we expanded. Now we have 20 different ethnicities wow. at our congregation. Amen. Okay. Wow. And that's what I see here. The beginning of that, where you are the witness. Amen. And this, you're, you're going to start sharing the gospel. Amen. And as you continue to do that, God is going to bless you because Amen. you are focused on His kingdom and not on your kingdom. Yes. Right? Amen. His righteousness, not your righteousness. Amen. And that's what it's all about. Amen. So that you can go follow through on what Jesus has told you to do. Amen. As we're seeing what's happening all throughout the world, um, we're seeing it in Haiti, we're seeing it in Gaza, we're seeing it in Ukraine. Um, you know, North Korea, South Korea is at the highest tension level. You know, China is threatening all these kind of things. You know, you kind of like wonder what's going on. I think part of what's going on is that we didn't do a good job. That's to be honest. As Christians, we didn't do a good job. You know, we didn't go out there and evangelize. We didn't tell people, okay, about Jesus. Korean churches in particular... Um, one of their problems is they form a mega church, but it's all about the pastor, and then nobody else does it. Everybody just comes and flocks to the pastor, and it becomes this pastor's church. Amen. It shouldn't be a pastor's church. It's God's church. Yes. Amen. Right? And it's God's vision. So we just got to follow through on what God wants us to do, and he's already given us that call, right, in Matthew, to go out to all the nations, right, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, and then to teach them all the things that I taught you. Yeah. But how many times do we do that? Yeah. I think that's where we, we, we've made a huge mistake and we're paying for it. We're paying for it in America because we've lost the vision yes. of, of, of this country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Yeah. Now we took prayer out of the schools. Yeah. And now we're, we're having these riots on the streets and mm -hmm. people are telling us things that are completely anti-Bible. Right? And they're convincing this next generation that's going to school to buy into that. So when they come back from college, they think they know more than God, more than the Bible, more than you as parents. And they say, I, I got all this knowledge from, you know, my professors. And, and the reality is, is they're going further and further away from God. Because they don't know who Jesus is. Let me ask you this question here. Who is Jesus to you? Jesus is my blank, blank, blank. Just come up to your mind. One, two, three. What are those three things in your head? Jesus is my... Mm, mm, mm. Share that now with your neighbor right now. Ooh, what, are, what are the three things? Jesus. My friend, my counselor, my counselor, my counselor, my counselor, my counselor, my Everybody share three things? Yes. All right. Let's read the scripture verse for us this morning. It's Matthew, the 21st chapter, 1 through 11. Actually, would you like to come forward and read this for me? Uh, the One through all of Matthew chapter 21, 1 through 11. Thank you. 
As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to Beth at the Mount of Olives. There Jesus sent two of the disciples on ahead with their, these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied up with her colt beside her. Unite them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything, tell them the master needs them, and then he will let them go at once. This happened in order to make come true what the prophet had said. Tell them to Tell them the city of Zion, look, your king is coming to you. He is humbled and rides on donkey and on the colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did what Jesus had told them to do. They brought the donkey and the colt, threw their cloaks, and then and them. And Jesus got on. A large crowd of people spread their cloaks of the, on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds walking in front of Jesus and those walking behind began to shout praise praise to David's son. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise be to God. When, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Who is he? The people asked. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The crowds Answered. When Jesus approached Jerusalem, there were a lot of thoughts on who Jesus was. Was he the Messiah? Was he the prophet? Was he the king? You know, John tells us the crowd met him because he had performed this miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. You know, and they shouted praises for that calling him king and David's son. And yet by the end of the week, what do we know? Strangely, the sh crowd shifted, right? And they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. I want to explore why that was. Even as they regarded Jesus in such high self-esteem, by examining some of the titles that they gave Jesus. First off, let's consider the title that both the disciples and the Pharisees gave him. Teacher, or in Hebrew, Rabbi. We see this title used very often. You have that first slide. We are told in Matthew chapter 13, verse 54 to 55, he taught in the synagogue, and those who heard him were amazed. Where did he get such wisdom, they asked. And what about his miracles? Isn't he the carpenter's son? The crowds were so amazed at him because he talked with such authority. Notice, there was no denying what was happening. They didn't question the miracles as having taken place, but when did they take place? You know, were they in violation of the Sabbath when those miracles had happened? Or by whose power, you know, were those miracles accomplished? Was it Satan that gave him that authority? The disciples of Jesus obviously did not think so, and so they followed him often, calling him teacher. And eventually, not only did he win over many of the Jews, but even teachers of the law, as they often asked him questions, addressing him as teacher, or even good teacher, in which Jesus responded, why do you call me good? No one is good but the Father alone. To this day, Christians and many Jews consider him a respectable teacher, one very knowledgeable and full of wisdom, so that many Christians do teach some of the things that Jesus taught. And you might say, wait, 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 wait a second, back that up here. I understand why Jewish people might teach some of the things that Jesus taught, but for Christians... Isn't that an oxymoron? I mean, how can you be a Christian and not follow the teachings of Jesus? Right? I want you to take a look at the latest poll taken in 2022, this is uh, two, a couple years ago, by Lifeway Research in response to this question. Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. <coughs> True or false? False. Oh. 
glad you can answer that. <laughs> in filtered survey results, they found out that 53% of folks professing Christianity in the United States today and 43% of evangelical Christians agreed with this statement. That Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. I don't know about you, but I find this mind-boggling. But what do you expect when you have professors denying the words of Christ? I went to a seminary like that. They called what they call the Jesus Seminar, and they would gather around this table, and they would have these different uh, beads and different culture, colors would say, "This is Jesus said this? I don't think Jesus said this. Oh, Jesus did, definitely didn't say this. He made, this is made up in the Bible. And they, they were scholars in a Christian seminary, supposedly. Wow. I had professors denying his resurrection, denying his virgin birth, Denying the exodus from Egypt, Old Testament professor. And now what do we have? We have people here denying marriage between a man and a woman. They deny the infallibility of Scripture. Let me tell you, Matthew 23, next verse. Jesus had to deal with this as well. He said, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the authorized interpreters of Moses' law. So you must obey and follow everything they tell you to do. Do not, however, imitate their actions. Because they don't practice what they preach. Mm. He didn't say, don't follow Moses' law or throw them out. But do them. In fact, he commanded us to do them. Next slide. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And... Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. A few years back, my country of my heritage, Korea, threw out the law on adultery. They said, no longer applicable. In our country here, America, we had laws on adultery. Now what do we have? Ah, don't matter. How many celebrities we have? They're married, and while they're married... Go ahead, and go ahead and meet somebody else instead. Uh, and while they are hooking up with somebody else, they go ahead and divorce this person and get married to this other person. Mm -hmm. They have no understanding of the sacredness of marriage. So <laughs> death do you part. It's until you get me so upset. Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to leave you. <laughs> you don't got no money? I'm out of here. <laughs> That's their way of thinking, and this next generation is buying into it hook, line, and sinker. And we're completely they're, they're redefining marriage. Mm -hmm. I was on vacation in Colombia. Do you know in Colombia, you know, this is where Cartagena, Colombia, that kind of mm -hmm. Colombia, mm -hmm. they now have a law where you can have marriage with three people. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, they passed that. That's insanity. But that is what is pervasive and it's going all through. And Christians are the ones that they, they buy into that, that, oh, it's just a man and a wife till death do you part. They're like, oh, my old school. That doesn't apply anymore. And that's what they're trying to teach you. Now we have churches and many denominations accepting gay marriage as acceptable. And they're, they're telling this next generation that the older Christians, you know, they're just buddy duddies. They don't know what they're talking about. Jesus is all about love, and mm -hmm. it's okay. Da 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 da. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. folks. Understanding Jesus as a teacher is very, very important. But even so, make no mistake about it. Jewish people, I know many, many Jewish people who will consider him a teacher. And now we have what we—I just saw you on the graph. So-called Christians. And I say that loosely in quotes, who do not see Jesus as the Son of God, but consider him as a great teacher. And we have even the disciples who saw him as rabbi, and yet all the disciples abandoned him in the Garden of Gethsemane. So just seeing him as a teacher, even a respectable teacher, is certainly not everything. What about Jesus as the Messiah, or the Anointed One? In Greek, the Christ. 
the one foretold in the scriptures to come as king out of the line of David. Since the majority of Jewish people deny him as the Messiah, shouldn't that be the most important title we should have and understand about Jesus? You know, indeed, I have no doubt that Jesus is the Messiah foretold in the scriptures, and he will come again. Amen. Yes. But do you realize that Muslims also believe that Jesus is the anointed one? That they too believe that Jesus is the Messiah told about in the scriptures? And yes, they too believe that Jesus will come again as the Messiah in the Amen. future. Amen. They also believe he was a prophet and a great teacher. But then they believe that it was Muhammad, mm -hmm. not the Holy Spirit that Jesus was referring to, mm -hmm. when he said he would send a great advocate, mm -hmm. helper, or comforter. And as we see these missiles flying back and forth, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, both sides, the reality is, you know, just because you have an understanding of teacher or you have an understanding of Messiah, it doesn't mean you have the understanding of the peace that Jesus is talking about. Mm -hmm. Muslims also do not see Jesus as the Son of God, and they deny that he even died on the cross. So seeing Jesus as Messiah is important, but once again, it is not everything. How about seeing him not just as Messiah, but Messiah and King? Understand that the original crowd that had gathered as Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem shouted out praises to him calling him a prophet, calling him king. Look at the slide, John tells us. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord! God bless the king of Israel! It is widely recognized that though the scriptures found in Zechariah chapter 9 were widely interpreted that the Messiah would come as king and overthrow the Roman government, bringing peace among the nations, Jesus' failure to do so is the reason that many Jews will say there's no way that he is the predicted Messiah. Mm -hmm. But even on the cross, understand that is who they were looking for. Mark 15, 31 says this, The chief priests and the teachers of the law made fun of Jesus, saying to one another, He saved others, but he cannot save himself! Let us see the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. The fact is, Jesus did come down from the cross, but not in the way imagined. And he rose again, and still they did not believe in him, because his way was not their way of being Messiah and King. So should Christians eliminate his title as king? Mm -mm. Or is there a deeper understanding of king of kings and the peace that Jesus offered to the world? I certainly think so. Isn't his kingdom not of this world? And is not the peace that Jesus offers a peace that the world cannot understand? A peace that only God can give. Peace between God and humanity. As Jesus washes away our sins. Certainly Jesus is king of kings. But not in the way many people thought. Including the zealots of his time. It may seem to be obvious that the most important title to recognize is the son of God. Something that was considered blasphemous and to this day is not recognized by both Jews and Muslims. Mm -hmm. But consider this. Who else was around during the time of the Passover festival that thought Jesus was the Son of God? Were not the demons present? Mm -hmm. The very ones who relished in the evil of inflicting pain and torture? The scriptures tell us repeatedly that the demons of this world recognize who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. They even address him with that title. Mm -hmm. Let me recount it for you. This story. When Jesus came to the territory of Gadara on the other side of the lake, he was met by two men who came out of the burial caves there. And these men had demons in them. Mm -hmm. And were so fierce that no one dared travel on that road. At once they screamed, 
What do you want with us, you son of God? Have you come to punish us before the right time? And next slide. Mark also tells us this. Jesus healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases and drove out many demons. He would not let the demons say anything because they knew who he was. Mm. So just because we know Jesus is the Son of God, it shouldn't get us too comfortable. That's not enough. Even the demons believe and they tremble with fear, mm. says James the brother of Jesus. What's missing? I think there are four other titles that are of critical importance. The first is Savior. And the people in the crowd, to their credit, were shouting as they cried out, Hosanna! Hosanna actually means, basically, save us! The problem is that they thought it was a temporal thing that God was after. A saving from the Romans. A saving from oppressive taxes. A saving from being humiliated. When what they and all humanity really needed is to be saved from their sins. Saved from the bondage that causes us all to go down a path of evil and pain. To be pawns of Satan in inflicting damage to others and even unto ourselves, and therefore unto God as we are created in the image of God. Salvation from sin is at the heart of the message of the gospel. And without it, we can get sidetracked into a lot of different things, just like these original people in the crowd who were looking for a change in their physical condition from the Romans. People do it all the time. They want to escape from their poverty or their frailties. But if Jesus is only salvation from these type of conditions, that's a false gospel. Often known as the health and wealth gospel. Paul himself prayed three times for the thorn in his flesh to go away. But God responded, my grace is sufficient for me. We've got to understand that God's plans are not our plans. And he knows what he's doing. Even when times get tough. Mm -hmm. When you're in the pit, sold as a slave by your half-brothers like Joseph was. God is sovereign and he's always in control. Amen. Even as these missiles rain, God is in control. Amen. Amen. Which is why the second image is really important. The word... Master. How many of you guys said master in your top three? Jesus had his disciples use that when they acquired the donkey and the colt tied together. Master, folks, implies a slave relationship. And in the modern day, we find it repulsive because of the abusive way this word has been used. But notice that in the scriptures, when applied to Christ and his disciples, this was not the case. Jesus never said, no, 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 don't use that word. Don't, call, don't ever call me master. No. He at times was called that by his disciples. Peter responded when told by Jesus to push the boat out further to the deep water and to let down the nets for a catch. What did he say? Master, Simon answered. We worked hard all night long and caught nothing. Basically, that statement is basically saying, I'm an expert fisherman. You recognize I've been fishing all my life. Okay? You know, I've been doing this all night. We didn't get any results. But to his credit, Peter does not stop here. Instead, he says, but if you say so, I will let down the nets. Notice, there was no need for Jesus to tell him again. He already had said it. Peter let down the nets. 
We need to have that kind of understanding with Jesus. When Jesus says to do something, we do it. How can you listen to Jesus as master unless you have that relationship with Jesus? Are you having that relationship with Jesus first thing in the morning? Because that's what a slave would do to a master. A slave wouldn't be sleeping in at 9 o'clock and just wondering if the master is well, I wonder what he's doing. <laughs> no. First thing in the morning, master, how can I attend to what your needs are? Amen. Right? Amen. I'm going to have a relationship with the master. I'm not, I, imagine if you were the slave sleeping in and the master, you know, doing his business. Oh, you can just sleep on him. You can just do whatever you want to do. Take off a whole year. <laughs> Doesn't happen that way. If you have a master slave relationship, you talk and listen to Jesus. And you do what the master tells you to do, hopefully with a lot less chatter and more obedience, because the master needs it and it gets done. I remember getting an inspiration from God to get some live animals. This is back in California. And our youth group was preparing this Christmas skit for the community. We had each of the rooms in the church sharing a different portion of the Christmas story. Uh, in the main sanctuary, we had our youth group president. He was really up. We had this like 45-foot high ceiling. And he was on this big ladder up at the cross. And he was singing like Gabriel, the Magnificat, to Angel and to Mary. You know, as an angel, he was a... He, it was wonderful. Each scene in the church had a different scenario. And at the very end of the church, we had an outdoor playground, fenced in. And I thought, this is where we're going to do the manger, Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus. And that last, the first opening night, I, I was like praying in the morning, and then I got this revelation from God. Where's the animals? you got to stay, we got to have animals. So I said, okay, we're going to get some animals. So I went to the outlying neighborhood where we were in Pomona, California. I knocked on the door of a farmhouse, and I asked him, and I told him what was going on. I said, you know, we're doing this Christmas play. You're more welcome to come out to it and stuff like that. I need some animals for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he said? You don't want any pigs, do you? <laughs> I said, no, that wouldn't be kosher. <laughs> I think we're all So I filled up that man with all his animals and brought it up to church and all my youth group kids were like, what the heck, Pastor John? You know, if God tells you to do something, do it. You don't get to see the miracles of God, okay, if you're just going to do your own thing. But if you're Noah and God tells you to do it, you're going to be building a boat when everybody else is like, it's perfectly sunny out. What the heck are you doing, Noah? <laughs> or Moses. And you'll see the Red Sea's part in your life. You've got to have that relationship with Jesus as your master. First thing in the morning, all throughout the day, and the last night. Amen. 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 No, Paul boldly uses the word slave. And he says we should all consider ourselves as slaves to righteousness instead of being slaves to sin. Remember what the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, right? That we should be willing to consider our slave, ourselves as slaves of Christ with all of our heart doing what God wants. He doesn't shy away from giving Christ that title in our lives but recognizes just how liberating that title is as a slave. Do loss. To be a slave of Christ. Are we sold out as slaves to the Master Jesus? You know, even Jesus, and this just blows me away when I think about it. Even Jesus, he's the Son of God, right? In obedience to his Father's will, gets down on his hands and his knees and he washes the feet of the disciples. It was an absolute no-no for Peter. It was unconceivable. How
How can his master get down on his knees and feet and, and wash the dirtiest part of his body where the dungs of cows would often get in between the toes of the sandal? But Jesus insisted. If Peter didn't allow him to wash his feet, he couldn't be a follower of Jesus. Was the washing of the feet then just about servanthood, or was it something more that they would come to understand in due time? Jesus himself said this, I do not call you servants because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I heard from my father. <clears throat> they were aware of the plans of God. And now they were faced with a choice. What to do with these plans going forward? In fact, that's what we all have. We are well aware of what the plans of God are. We have the Bible, the Word of God. We, we can get through it and understand exactly what He wants us to accomplish, right? It's His kingdom. It's all about His kingdom, not our kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what are we going to do about it? I had a young man in our church testify that his primary understanding of Jesus was that Jesus was my friend. You know? And he came up, and after he went to his mission trip on India, he confessed that he put Jesus on the same level as his other friends. They're just all basically friends together that he played Xbox with. He just spent his day shooting up the enemy all around all these things. As if Jesus could be that equivalent. Was Jesus meant to be just this guy that you have a beer with and hang out and play video games together with? Is that what Jesus was really after, just somebody to pal around with? Or did Jesus have a much bigger intention on earth with his mission on earth? Which comes to the third title, which is similar to master in that we recognize his authority, but it's more than master in that we recognize him as God. Thomas declared this after he ran away, just like the rest of the disciples. It was a week later when Thomas saw Jesus come into the upper room, and even though the doors were locked, there he was, alive, in the flesh, scolding him, and he said to put his finger in the holes in his hands and slots and in the side, and he wouldn't be saying, Stop, stop, you're doubting, and believe. Take a look. And what did Thomas reply? My Lord and my God. Jesus wasn't just a teacher, a healer, a miracle worker, a prophet, or a priest, or an earthly king who sits on a throne. But Jesus was and is God, and who is to be followed and obeyed as Lord. Paul here shares truthfully. Thanks a lot. That no one can confess Jesus Christ as Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? <coughs> to confess, to confess Jesus as Lord. Confess, what do we, what do we mean by confess? When you confess, you tell the truth. So that when we tell the truth that Jesus is Lord in our life, that means we're doing it not by our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Recognize there are plenty and plenty of people out there who will call Jesus Lord, but they won't see him. Like the people who were looking for a certain Messiah and couldn't see Jesus as the Messiah, so there will be many people who will shout out, Lord, Lord, right? Next slide. Matthew 25, 44 says this, When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and we would not help you? Recognize, they're calling Jesus Lord. Jesus says, I tell you, whenever you refuse to help one of these least important ones, you refuse to help me. It's not a matter of crying out, Lord, Lord. Any person can do that. But confessing that Jesus is Lord requires the Holy Spirit in you, which inspires and leads you to obey. When I first went to our, this church of 25 people, they had never gone on a mission trip before in their life. And when I got them to say, hey, let's go on a mission trip, they would complain. 
Are you kidding? We're going to die. We're going to get kidnapped. You want our kids to go there? No, they don't deserve it, you know? And they had all these issues with going into Mexico. I was like, you know, a church that doesn't do missions, you're in the, what, what's going on? What's going on when you're not evangelizing, when you're not sharing the gospel with people? You have tons of friends and you don't ever tell them about Jesus and they don't even know Jesus, then what kind of friends are they? You know? We've got to follow through. Jesus himself asked this question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet do not do what I tell you? Think about that. He has told us to do certain things. Why are we making all these excuses and not doing them? We think we know better than Jesus, like Peter, and then being a master of the, of the boat. He's the best fisherman there is. Is that why? If we really love Jesus, Jesus tells us we will obey his commandments. Oftentimes, you know, Christians look for Jesus just in the throne room of their local church. And they forget that he came down from heaven in the form of a baby in a manger. What's a manger? Some people in my church, they, they, when they first come down, they, they didn't even know what manger was. They thought it was manager. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you make the whole thing, and then it's like, where's the manger? They think the stable is the manger. No, the manger is a feeding trial for animals. Mm -hmm. I that, yeah. You know, where the hay is. That's where they placed Jesus. So this is the place where the animals were eating out. Why? Why was Jesus born on the outskirts of manger, not an opulent bed in a palace? Was it not because Jesus identifies with the marginalized, to the least of these? That the gospel is for all people, including those many that many people would not consider? That's such a huge problem. I was out, our church was considering joining the uh, CRC denomination. And so we went to Calvin College in Michigan, and I went to their seminary, and I went to the, one of the biggest churches out there in the CRC, and in that church, it was completely <coughs> white. There was one black guy that, that was in there. So during the fellowship time, there was like about 500 people in this church. Beautiful church. I mean, it was like pristine. It was like one of those things that you saw in the Christmas cards and stuff like this. <laughs> After the fellowship, we went to talk with this guy, who, you know, and ask him, "Oh, so how'd you pick this church and stuff like that?" And he says, "Ah, oh, I'm actually visiting." And I'm, oh, you're, today's your first day. And he goes, "Yeah, yeah, I'm my first day." And I said, "I'm actually trying to start a, a church in the area," and so I actually came to talk with this pastor, you know, about, you know, seeing if I could use his church in the afternoon. Because I'm using the afternoon to do that. And so I gave him my card and stuff. We, we continued talking. Uh, and later on, I found out that the, the congregation said no. Mm -hmm. you know, they didn't want his kind mm -hmm. of that church. I found out later that there's white and then there's Dutch white. And apparently, it's supposed to be a, it's just a much stronger version of, of it. <laughs> we have a problem when we want to focus on just a white church, mm -hmm. a black church. Korean church, you know, and we don't understand the gospel is for all. Our country has had had that problem for a while, you know. And, uh, you know, during the civil rights, we didn't understand that. And then there were white fountains and black fountains. You know, the, the Native Americans; those are the savages. The gospel's not for them. You know, the greatest movement of people coming to the gospel in India. You know, which group it is? It's the Untouchables. It's the people on the bottom end of the scale in the caste system. They're coming like droves. Why? Because from the rest of the population, they're considered untouchable. They're considered not even human. Wow. Wow. But all of a sudden, now you're sharing the gospel to them, and you're saying, you are love. And God wants you also to be part of the kingdom of God. And you are valuable. And God had, it doesn't matter what you've done. What your past is, God can redeem you from that. Amen. Because he's died on the cross for you as well. Okay? That's the truth. That's the gospel. 
All are invited. That's what the Bible says in Peter, right? God desires none to perish, but that all might have eternal life. Which comes to my fourth image, the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. A virgin will become pregnant and have a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. I find that most comforting, that God on high came into our world to live among us and with us, so that if we believe and we understand what he said, his presence is not a billion miles away, but he's with me. That his words are true and real. He says this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. That I don't go through this world alone. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff will come from me. Folks, the images of Jesus are many, and we've gone through a lot of these. Certainly just having one, I hope you can see, is very limiting. But when we see them all together, we are in a whole different ballgame. His kingdom, and not our own kingdom. With Good Friday and Easter behind us. Stereotypically, what happens do you see in the church? Attendance drops, right? They come for the, 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 the big food festivity, and then that's it. Well, then what is Jesus, your caterer? I know you're clapping for that sub sandwich, but... <laughs> you can't blame everything on, on that burger from on me, okay? <laughs> okay? The reality is, there is going to be this huge banqueting table in the kingdom of heaven. Absolutely. Amen. But what the food that he asked you to work for? He says, to believe. Right? You, he told these people, you come for this food, and you're not really understanding. you got to be coming for the food that doesn't just disintegrate. Mm. I am. Right? Yeah. 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 Right? Uh, you, you you drink from me, you're never going to be thirsty again. Amen. You know, you eat from me, you're going to know the real deal. Amen. Okay. And this is what I'm asking you to do. Take some time to meditate, reflect, Amen. repent, and adjust as necessary who Jesus is for you. Amen. Hopefully, you won't miss the fullness of his presence in your life. You'll understand him better. How you can totally alter, okay, your trajectory, where God wants you to be, how he wants you to be, by you listening to the voice of God, you hear it, and then you follow through. You Amen. do it. Amen. Okay, Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your loving time. Thank you. To have come down from heaven to save us from our sins. Yes, Lord. That we might live more than conquerors through your son Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Master. God with us now and forever. And in his name we pray. Amen. 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 that question. Who is Jesus? You know, listen to a sermon that gives you the ability to cheat. <laughs> but not in a bad way, but in a good way. God already gives us the answer. Jesus is Lord and God. Jesus is the most pleasing thing to the Father. Amen. Whenever anything is discussed, Scripture that pleased the Father, in perfect, it always points to Jesus. To whom I am well pleased. John 14, 23. Can somebody read that verse right now? Somebody read that verse. We're going to pray for this. 1423. What? I got it. 
Go ahead, John. John, read John. <laughs> Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Amen. It's not about God loving me. It's me about me loving him. Lovest thou me. Do we really love him? He's, these words here challenged even me in everything I think. They challenged me even as a pastor about missions, going another step up, not only supporting, but praying to move us out in missions. Jose? I'm here. It's important that we hold this. We need to treasure this. We need yeah. to treasure Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, your word brings forth light. I thank you for using your servant, John Parker, your child. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for his humility and his love for you. And that he wanted to make sure everybody knew, without a reason of doubt, who your son is. Yes. That when we're asked a question like you asked Peter, who do men say that I am? Yes. Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Lord, it's not only about a confession, but it's also about the actions that follow afterwards. Mm -hmm. yes. That we are obedient to your commandments. Yes. And Father, in Jesus' name, we in our flesh cannot do it. But only through the power of the Holy yes, Spirit Lord. can we do these yes. things. Empower us, strengthen us yes. to honor you in everything we do. Yes. To value you, yes. to love you, yes. to fear you, to give you the honor that is rightly due yes. you. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. Lord. That when we walk like Christ, it is the best imitation that we could ever do, Lord yes. God. It's not flattery. It's worship. And we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that those who, who think that they know God, they know you, that you would put a conviction upon them right now. And let them sit there and say, I don't. Don't let them drift away in the deception we ask you, Lord. But provoke them and and move them. Holy Spirit, your job yes. is to convict them of yes. all righteousness. Yes. Yes. We ask that you will do that. Yes. Of all judgment. Yes. Jesus name. Yes. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for this ministry. We pray for Pastor John Parker right now. Yes. Yes. Lord, he's making a stepfather from pastor the mission. That's including his wife. And Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would minister to him right now in the name of Jesus. That you would lead him and guide him. That you would provide the pastor perfect for that church. Lord God, not the perfect pastor, but the one that would help grow it. Perfecting the saints. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray, Lord God, for monies and whatever it is, Lord God. Whatever country you bring them to. Wherever you bring them, Lord God. Lord, we just pray, Lord God. We pray that you would just anoint them and set them forth, oh God. Lord, in this offering that I have in my pocket for him. We pray that this would be seed money yes. to sow into the mission field, into his life, 
In yes. Jesus' name, yes. Lord God. Yes. And Lord God, if you should cause us to stay around as a church, even to that time, oh God, I pray that this group would put him on support. In yes. Jesus' yes. name. Yes. Father, I thank you for what you will and shall do, oh God. Yes. In Jesus' name. We lift up, Lord God, the fellowship. We pray for the food. We ask that you would bless it. And bless it indeed. Bless it to our body and bless our conversation for your glory. May you be glorified in everything that we do. We thank you and we praise you. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.